Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockworks Macro YouTube channel. This is Off Speaking and I'm honored to have as guest of the day, Professor Steve Keen. Professor Steve Keen is a distinguished research fellow at the UCL in London. And also, to be honest, his best work today is on Patreon and on Substack. And I urge you, if you're not doing that yet, to go check Professor Steve Keen's work, especially on money, which is what are we going to talk about today, both on Substack and on Patreon. Professor, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good to meet you. Looking forward to meeting in person next time. <laughs> we both happen to be in the Netherlands for some reason these days, so we're going to meet uh, in person very soon. Today, let's do this this way. And um, there is, you are an authority when it comes to money and uh, actually trying to make people understand how our monetary system really works and money creation really works. We often talked about central banks and commercial banks and who prints money and what money they print. But what about the government, Professor, in the first place? Because deficit spending is one of the most... Uh, you know, hot topics, debated hot topics in uh, in money creation world. So can you give us your quick take and then maybe walk, walk us through the process of money creation by the government? Okay. Um, the essential, of course, there are two, two entities in our society which can create money. Banks create money by lending out more than they take back in repayments. Governments create money by spending more than they take back in taxation. And that's the thing which people uh, don't understand. They think government has to borrow before they can spend, and that is categorically wrong. Okay? The government issues bonds, but it's nothing like us borrowing money from a bank. <clears throat> so we need to get, I need to explain all those, that logic immediately. But the other essential difference between how governments create money and how banks create money, banks create money by expanding their assets and liabilities at the same time. So their loans go up, <coughs> which creates more debt. Their deposits go up by the same amount, which creates more money. There's no change in the equity position for the bank out of the act of simply creating a loan. Whereas for the government, it creates money by going into negative equity. But the negative equity it goes into is precisely what are the positive equity that creates for the private sector. And that's the, the major source, I think, of misunderstanding. Um, some of it, I think, people revolt against the idea of being a negative equity. But the thing is, um, if you're going to have financial claims, somebody's going to be a negative equity to somebody else. And it's, uh, the government is rather re more able to support that than uh, any other institution in society. Yes, that's the major distinction. And we actually want to explain this step by step by using your excellent software programs, uh, which, by the way, I think you are working on a new version of your famous Minsky software program. Um, but why don't you actually share the screen with us and walk us through what the heck happens when the government does deficit spending in the first place? And let's talk about the government, the private sector, the banks, central banks, the whole thing. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll just share my screen now. And uh, this is the uh, this is my software package called Minsky. I'm building another one on top of it called Rabble, which is commercial and designed for data analysis. This is designed to model how, uh, basically the dynamic modeling program, which happens to be excellent for modeling money, because we've added the capacity to model money using double entry bookkeeping. So I've got a model involving banks, the public, the central bank and treasury. And when I look at the tables, and I'm sorry, I can't make this one, this, this part we can't yet zoom. Uh, but what you can see is that you have the treasury, which has an asset, which is it, its asset is its bank account at the central bank. I'm saying it starts there with $100 billion in it. Government spending reduces that amount of uh, money in that bank account. There's no offsetting liability for the government at this point. So the fall in the asset is equivalent to a fall in its equity. Taxation, <coughs> pardon me, replenishes that account and also has a positive effect on its equity. So the equity position for the government out of running a deficit where spending is greater than taxation is equity falls because negative equity out of the process. When that so, turns up on the... So, Professor, yeah, I'm yeah. going to stop you from time to time because you're going to say some important yeah. things here. Mm -hmm. So first of all, very cool to have a uh, double entry accounting. I mean, it's easy to understand. It's the accounts, assets, liabilities, and then you made a different row for equity just to show people what actually happens to the equity side of the liability part yeah. of the balance sheet. Okay. So we start from the treasury and then you say, okay, we have assets and we have liabilities here. And assets is, you know, treasury assets, government spending in general. What does government spending do to this, uh, to this uh, asset side? That, that actually interacts with taxation. The more the government taxes, the more this, uh, this side of the balance sheet goes up, they spend it goes down. But on the liability side, nothing happens in the first place. So mm -hmm. you're basically saying when the government does deficit spending, it blows a hole in their balance sheet. That's what you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's a hole which the government, if, when you look at the national accounts around the world, in the financial assets are your claim on somebody else. So if you and I have a financial asset, if, I, if you lend me money, for example, I'm in debt to you, okay? I've got a liability, you've got an asset. When you add the two together, you get zero. Okay? Yeah. So the sum of all financial assets, which is claims on other people, is, is zero. Uh, non-financial assets, things like houses, uh, shares of the, the initial value of a share or the, the, the increased value of a share over time, uh, they are non-financial assets. There's an asset with no matching liability. Now, the government, in that sense, has the asset of the entire country. So there are the, the non-financial assets of the bank with the financial uh, equity the government gets into are backed by the fact the government, you know, owns the country, so to speak. So <clears throat> the government can cope with massive negative equity. And in fact, its negative equity is the public's positive equity. That's a super important point. So if you actually would put together, um, let's say, government spending, you would see an exact offsetting amount into the increasing net wealth, net worth for the private sector. So government net spending actually increases, it's mirrored by an increase in net worth in the private sector into our balance sheet, basically, Professor. Is that correct? That's correct. And you can see that in the second table here. So the first table shows the Treasury's position. Spending, its, it's equity is tax minus spend, or the change in its equity is tax minus spend. So if spending exceeds taxation, its equity is falling. The, gov the public's equity, on the other hand, is spend minus tax. So as government spending exceeds government taxation, the equity of the public rises. And then the, the, rather than taking money from the public, a deficit creates money for the public and creates equity as well. And that's where it differs from what happens with a, uh, a bank loan. And I can show that very easily, of course, as we, we might do in a moment. So, Professor, let's make the example. Let's walk back to the government spending the United States did in 2020, for instance, right? So, yeah. government decided to send checks at home for people, literally. So, you got a check in your post box. What is literally the process that happened from the Treasury balance sheet to the private sector balance sheet when the government of the United States decided to print those checks for people? Tell us exactly what happened on those two balance sheets, which are the, the, the top two, basically, you, you show up there. Well, the top two are like this is the beginning and this is the end of the process. It's got to pass through the central bank and the banking system for it to actually happen. And that's why, that's why I've got a pattern of four tables here. You'll notice that spending and taxation, which are the only two operations I'm showing in this very, very bare bones model, occur eight times. So it's not double entry, it's oct octopal entry bookkeeping <laughs> when you actually show because it has to pass through the central banks and the banks as well. So the spending by the treasury, first of all, increases the reserve accounts of the banks, at the, the private banks at the central bank. So the spending goes down here, the, the, the liability the central bank has towards the treasury with its deposit account, that declines. The liability goes towards the so the banks with their reserve accounts rises. There's no change in the central bank's overall liabilities. But money is funds rather not money. Funds are transferred from the treasury to the from the treasury account to the reserve accounts. And this is actually this is like a, there'd be if this is done in, in the Netherlands, there'd be a, Alf's name. It'd be one of the people receiving it for one of the banks inside here. So we're aggregating what's happening with everybody's bank accounts. Uh, into into one big basket up here, and that means we're aggregating down here as well. So the treasury account goes down uh, when the government spends, the reserve account of the banks go up, vice versa with taxes. And then through the banks themselves, uh, what happens is their assets and their liabilities both rise. And this is the, um, the, the way in which this is similar to what banks do when they lend. When the government puts the money in reserves, the reserves go up and the banks then put that money into people's deposit accounts. So that's the overall mechanics of uh, of government money creation. This is this is just incredible. We need to go step by step again. So the government blows a hole in their balance sheet. Uh, let's say the United States government decides to send checks at home to people. They blow a hole in their balance sheet and American people find themselves with literally a check out of nothing. And that's the public uh, balance sheet in your in your point there. They literally see their de their deposits going up. Professor, they, their bank account goes up, basically, and there is no liability attached to that. There is no mortgage. There is no loan. There is nothing there. It's literally equity going up for the private sector, which, as we said, it's the mirror of the negative equity the government has created in their own balance sheet. Okay, cool. Now, the public has more deposits, which means the government spending has created money for us. Okay, interesting. 
then of course these deposits are reflected into the banking system. I mean, we have more deposits, therefore we deposit this money somewhere in some banks. So this is the second step of your tables where bank deposits go up, bank reserves also go up as the entire balance sheet of the banking system rises, which is also in the mirror of the fact that the government spending moves down the Treasury General account, and that's reflected on the reserve side as well, uh, on the that's central right. bank yeah. balance sheet. Mm. So... Um, you basically are telling us that government spending does not crowd out the private sector. It actually adds money. The opposite. The, the opposite. It creates money for the public for the private for the public sector. It's, it's public and private. We use the words in a weird way, but yeah, the public, you and me, uh, when the government runs a deficit, we have more money, and that still means we we have less need to, to borrow from the banks because the government's created money for us without a liability attached. That's quite a thing. Now, let's mm. walk again to what happens in the central bank and bank side of the balance sheet, just mm. to make sure mm. people understand that. So the Treasury mm. spends money, which yep. means the liability side, walk us through that Treasury general account basically needs to go down, right? That goes down. And, and as it goes down, the reserve accounts of the banks, are the, 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 the central, to be a bank, one, one thing element of being a bank is you have an account at the central bank. And therefore, money can be transferred from the Treasury's account there to your account, which doesn't affect the overall uh, equity position of the central bank. You'll notice there's nothing showing up in the equity of the central bank here. Uh, it's simply saying its liabilities have gone from owing, uh, having to, uh, money that it's got to give to the Treasury has gone down. Money that it's got to honour for the uh, for the banks has gone up. So there's just it, it's a liability swap at this level, and it becomes an asset, uh, and, and then. That then increases the assets of the of the banking sector down here because uh, as just just as the gov as the public's equity rises because when spending exceeds taxation, the reserves of the the, the assets of the private banking sector rise as well by exactly the same amount spending minus tax, and that's essential to get that uh, transfer that money through to the public. It has to go to their bank accounts, and that then shows up here in an increase in the equity of the public sector. So, Professor, now if somebody has managed to understand the vital concept that treasury spending creates net worth for the private sector, mm. which is quite a, a thing to say in finance these days, despite it's 2022, and this is clearly how double entry accounting works, as you're showing, mm. but it's yeah. not mainstream knowledge. Uh, the second thing is that people will be asking us, uh, when the government spends in our monetary system, in our accounting system, they need to borrow, they need to offset this as an, with an accounting item called mm -hmm. bond issuance, basically. Yeah. That's how we do this. So how does that work in the first place? Well, let's take a look at it. Uh, what I've got to do to show that is to add an extra asset for the banks of bonds. So let's call this bonds and bonds owned by banks. So I've got a subscript of B there. And then what we have is the Treasury sells bonds. So we just have here Treasury, Treasury bond sales. And that uh, that then means you're going to get an increase in bonds here. So I'm going to have, I'll, sell, I'll call this bond uh, sold by the Treasury to the banks. Yeah. Okay. And, of course, that means that the way they pay for it, they use their reserves. So bonds sold by the Treasury to banks. And that balances the table. And now, if we take a look at what's happening uh, on that on that full view of the all the tables in the system, we now have an entry which uh, I've got the the bank. You can see here the operations turned up in the bank's table. So there's been a, an asset swap for the bank. They've got less reserves and more bonds. They go they get more interest on bonds. So of course they're going to take the offer. And the money that the the funds not money the funds they're using to buy it are created by the deficit in the first place. But now what I've got to show is what happens on the central bank. They go to the central bank's table, and we now have an unbalanced operation here, as you can see. And so what, what happens when the bond sales, they actually increase the amount of money in the Treasury's account. So if I now show uh, the matching entry there, uh, what that does is make sure the if the bond sales are equal to the deficit, then the Treasury account will remain constant. And that's the real impact of selling bonds. It doesn't they're not necessary for the actual operation of money creation. That's still money creation is strictly uh, the deficit itself. But what it means is the Treasury doesn't go in, into a uh, an overdraft at the central bank. We go back and take a look at the tables now, and that's our situation. I haven't yet shown what's happening with the with the uh, Treasury, so I've got to add that detail as well. We go to the Treasury, 
And now, of course, it's got a liability, which is bonds, uh, that owes to the banks. And so, uh, as you can see, and I'll just bring this across to the main, main view as well again here, um, there is no, um, when, when, when this happens, um, for the Treasury, let's move, move down here again, looking up here, uh, that it doesn't affect their equity. So they've, they've got, the assets have risen because the money from the bond uh, sales are turning up in their treasury account, but they've now got a matching liability as well. So there's, that's now, it's expanding its assets and liabilities that are affecting its equity. So the actual auction of, of bond sales has got nothing to do with money creation and it's not borrowing. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, simply a rule that's imposed on governments by their politicians to say you can't have an overdraft account at the central bank. So if the issue of bonds is equal to deficit spending, you won't go into overdraft. There's interest payments as well, of course, but I can easily add that and, and show that's got the same sort of effect. Professor, let's, let's, before you, you talk about interest on bonds, let's go back to the main thing because I want to spend a few minutes more on this. It's really important. Mm. So adding bonds to the equation, hasn't changed the fact that the column equity in there is negative yeah. for the government and it's positive for the public. That hasn't exactly. changed a tiny bit. The only mm -hmm. thing that has changed is that on the central bank liability side, the government is not allowed by the current rules that we self-impose to run mm -hmm. a negative equity, basically a negative TGA, if you wish, a negative account at the central yeah. bank. It can't go yeah. in overdraft. That's the yeah. only thing that the bond issuance accounting wise is matching. And now obviously somebody needs to buy these bonds and who buys these bonds in your example is commercial banks. We didn't even talk about the central bank doing QE and buying the bonds. We are staying away mm -hmm. from that for the time being. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're having the commercial banks. And remember the commercial banks by the very government spending in the first place have more reserves. Deposits account for the private sector go up, reserves go up as well for the, for the commercial banking sector. Commercial banks can just use these reserves and buy bonds. Bonds are extremely well regulatory treated. They are uh, HQLA assets. They are high quality liquid assets. So banks don't have an air cut on these liquidity holdings. They have no risk weights attached to these uh, bond holdings. Zero percent, zero capital needed to buy those. And they yield more than reserves in the first place in very, in very often. So they are going to take the offer, as you say, and they are going to fund. Yeah fund, which is the right verb, but they are going yeah. to swap their reserves for bonds in the first place. Now, I have yeah. a question for you, Professor. What happens mm. if banks say, nah, I'm not going to buy, I'd rather have reserves. So then us, Mr. <laughs> Alf and Mr. Professor Steve Keen, we need yeah. to buy the bonds from the government. What happens then? So there's a new asset, which I'm going to call bonds. That's my mistake, pardon me. Bonds owned by the public. Okay, so that's where the where the transfer goes to. So we now have that's going to rise. So bond and uh, sold by the banks to the public yep. goes there, and then we now go to the treasury, and the treasury now has a new liability, and then that balances that. So again, uh, it doesn't affect the equity of the bank; it just changes who owns the bonds. And and just as the deficit spending by the uh, government created the reserves, which are a fund. I say fund because you understand this because the government, you can't, money is what you can spend on anything. Funds is what you can spend on specific things. Yes. And in the bank's case, they are only allowed, effectively only allowed to buy bonds, uh, pretty much from reserves. So that's, that's the reserves being created by spend minus tax there. And the, the, the banks then sell bonds to the public. The money, this is now money, uh, which people would otherwise have spent buying, you know, uh, Christmas trees. Uh, and now it goes across to having bonds, which then earn a rate of interest for them rather than you know, putting a Christmas tree okay. uh, in, their, in their lounge room. So, Professor, the reason why I asked you that is yeah. we explained that the Treasury literally blows a hole in their balance sheet that it increases mm. the net worth <clears throat> for us, the private sector. Mm. The accounting yep. rules we self-impose on, on basically ourselves force the, the government to issue bonds to fund this operation, which in reality is not funding, but it's just merely making sure that the government doesn't run a negative account at the central bank. Of course, yeah. these bonds need to be bought by somebody. So when we say the central bank buys the bonds, they simply swap the existing reserves for bonds or they actually, they actually increase the, the their private budget. Bank they increase yeah, the, the balance bank. sheet with quantitative easing. They create new reserves. They use these reserves mm. to buy bonds. Very clear that we are not doing anything from our side. Mm. 
When yeah. banks buy bonds, also they're not doing anything because they're taking the newly created reserves by the fiscal spending in the first place and they're using those yeah. to buy bonds. In that case, us, the public sector, we get an injection of net worth and we have to do nothing. We don't have to buy bonds. We don't have a liability attached to that, nothing. Mm. Yeah. When the, when the central bank isn't doing QE and banks are not immediately supporting the government by buying bonds, then it's up to us the private sector to actually buy these bonds. And you're showing that in the public area there, which would be mm. us, the people, the public actually. In that case, mm. the newly created deposits that have been created by the government when they spend money have to be invested from our end into buying those bonds, Professor, which means we can't spend this money on buying Christmas trees. And yeah, I think, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, when the private sector, us, need to, need to buy the bonds the government is issuing, that's probably the only case when government deficit spending doesn't create immediately spendable money for the private sector. So Goldman Sachs is part of the public. And what happens normally is that when the, when the, when the banks in the initial purchasing round, which is shown here, when the Treasury sells the bonds to the banks, the banks then trade that with non-bank financial institutions. Uh, so that is reducing the amount of money in non-financial institutions, but increasing the money earning assets that they have. They've got more bonds which earn the interest rate return from the uh, yeah. from the treasury uh, so that's why they do it um, but yeah it's uh, in both cases the money which is used to create the bonds is created by the deficit spending of the government extremely important point i would say mm -hmm. so government yeah. spending creates money for the private sector without a liability attached to that that's an important that's distinction right. with bank lending professor which is also yeah. a form of creating money for us yeah. But it involves a, a debt for the private sector as well. We have a mortgage to pay back, a loan to pay back. So can you show us how that money is created, but it's different than money creation from the government in the first place? So government deficit spending increases the net worth of the public. Borrowing from the banking sector does not increase the net worth of the public. That's very clear, I guess. If I get a mortgage to buy a house, Professor, they, the bank credits my account out of nowhere. Uh, mm. But they also want the money back. So my balance sheet has a liability attached to that, which is exactly by the same amount. And that's the mortgage. That's very clear. And, th and for, the, for the banking sector, obviously, that inflates their balance sheet in aggregate because new money is created when money is lent out. So new deposits mm. are created. Uh, so new assets and new liabilities are created for the bank, which means there is mm. new money being created, literally. But there is no new net worth being created that's because right. there is a liability yeah. attached to the private sector. When the government spends mm. money, they lower my taxes, they send me checks at home, and I don't need, I don't have a liability attached to that. One can yeah. argue later on the government will tax me more. Uh, yeah, sure, if we continue to think along these, these lines, the government will want to tax me more, but in principle, there is no liability attached to new money being. And, and what you, when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you look at the data, it, it clearly supports the argument you and I are making versus the must pay the debt back nonsense that neoclassicals talk about. Uh, there's 120 plus, I think about 130 years now. I think actually it's 190, 1901, so 120 years of data uh, at the, the White House showing the average deficit, government deficit. And the average deficit, even in living out the wars in the, first, in the last 120 years, is about 2.5% of GDP. So the government has never paid its debt down. It did once do that back in the 1830s, and that led to what's called the Panic of 1837, <laughs> uh, when the suddenly reduction in the money supply, you could only get money from private money creation, and there was a, the, a bigger financial calamity, in fact, in the Great Depression. Of course, it's so long ago, we've forgotten about it. But uh, the government... Uh, you know, the, the government deficit creates money for us. And the more that it does that, the less pressure there is to borrow money um, for the pub. So you actually get, there's not a, a direct causal link, but there's less necessity to borrow um, from the public uh, when there's more government spending. Professor, I surely hope the government doesn't want to pay back its debt because that means it's going to destroy money very quickly. And I don't want that. And no, nobody should want that, to be very honest, because that's how it works. When the government decides to pay back their debt, they're taxing the private sector more, which means it literally, they're draining money away from the private sector. So I'm not sure whether you want that. <laughs> it shouldn't be the case. Now, one last thing I want to say, Professor, before I let you go. First of all, Congratulations. I mean, you've been basically giving away a lesson on government spending, creating money using your Minsky platform live. And yeah. I swear, guys, we didn't prepare this. The professor just went <laughs> on and did it. Incredible. Really, I'm impressed. But 
Can you tell us if people are interested in these topics and understanding how mm. really money works, yeah. how can they follow you? Where do they find more about this? Uh, first of all, if you want to get Minsky, uh, then you go to SourceForge, which is a, a repository of open source software. So sourceforge.net slash project slash Minsky. The URL you can see up there and you can download a copy there uh, for free. It's, it's, it's a no cost software. And uh, But in terms of following my work, there's two locations. There's Patreon which is here. That's patreon.com slash Prof. Steve Keen. And then the other site is, is you have as well Substack. So it's profstevekeen.substack.com. And either of those sites um, are, are, are equally okay. Uh, the advantage of, of Patreon is that there are <clears throat> lower membership levels. So there's $1 a month uh, and there's lots of levels. The, the highest is 1000 a month. I've got one, one person giving me $300. Uh, over here, it's minimum is 5 and there's five dollars a month. I've forgotten the other two levels, but uh, so Substack is more restricted in the range, but probably an easier software package to use than Patreon. But those are those two options. Professor, both your Patreon and your Substack are incredible resources. I've read all your books, by the way, as well. Something that people should do if they want to get an understanding of how money really works. Um, New Economics and Manifesto, I think, is your last book, Professor. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was an incredible book. Again, uh, guys, you heard it. You saw the presentations. You saw uh, that how important it is to understand how money really works um, mm -hmm. and actually debunking the many myths that, unfortunately, at university, at school, in any macro course are still taught. That's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. And the professor is first in line fighting this myth and try to debunk them. Thanks for being here with us, Professor, and I hope to have you back soon. Thank you very much, Alf.